Well, hi, friends. So welcome back to session number nine. I'm Dr. Steve Scheibner, and this is the completion of the nine practices of the proactive parent. In fact, we're going to do practice number seven, eight, and nine in this session, all three in the same session, repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. And if there was ever a need for a reset button in our lives, this lesson is it. And I've talked to so many parents over the years. I've talked to many of you, and you go, you know what? Over the years, and especially going through this whole course, you know, the eight weeks leading up to this week, you know what, Steve, I've, I've blown it in some areas. I've done some things that I regret and I wish I had done differently. And, you know, is there a way to kind of turn back the clock? Can we go back and undo those things? And, you know, sadly, there's not a clock that you can turn back, but there is a biblical reset button that we can push. God knows that we're a flawed world and we're a flawed people and we're sinners and, you know, we need repentance and forgiveness and restoration. And I can't tell you how important this lesson is. I think personally this is the most important lesson. Now we're going to bring Megan out in a few minutes and she's going to complete this lesson for us. But if you've got your Bibles and if you're at home, you've got a minute to go grab your Bible. To, you know, pause the video, pause the download, go take a look at, grab your Bible, come back and get started again. Because I want to open up to Luke chapter 17. If you don't have it, that's fine. I'm going to read it to you out loud. Because Luke 17, to me, is the, the practice of repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. It's not a perfect world in parenting, and we blow it sometimes. And in fact, there are some ways that we've blown it as parents that we're not even aware of. There's some things that we've done, uh, and, and the Lord may be bringing those things to mind over the last eight weeks. And you say, okay, Steve, now what do I do about it? Well, Luke 17 is what holds the answer. So I call this the restoration model. You know, sometimes we just need to restore in our relationships. If there's been some friction in the extended family, maybe you've got older children that, well, they're not completely estranged from you, but boy, the, the relationship has really been stretched over time and there's been some things said back and forth and words that were used that you regret. How do you go back and, and hit that reset button? Well, Jesus sets the tempo for us and the pace in Luke 17. I'm just going to read to you the next few verses. It kind of sets the stage. He said to his disciples, this is Jesus speaking, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. Uh, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. And the, the perspective here is, somebody who's older and more mature and somebody who's younger that we might cause to stumble. It's really kind of talking about parents in a lot of ways, although I don't think that's the only application for this. And Jesus sets the, the pace and the tone in the first couple of verses saying, this is serious stuff. You need to listen to me about this. You don't want to be this guy, this gal. You don't want to be this parent that causes someone behind you, coming up behind you to stumble. So pay attention. That's what he's saying in the first couple of verses. He says in verse 3, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. That's kind of the role of the parent in a lot of ways. We're the ones that look at our children and we go, you know, you just sinned. And we have the appropriate position in their lives and the authority to walk right up to them and say, I'm rebuking you right now. And we do that in a number of different ways. And we've covered that for eight weeks up to this point. And if that child repents, then forgive him. It's done. Don't carry it with you. Don't, don't belabor the point. Just let's move on, right? Let's get over that thing. This also applies to relationships that we have with other adults. If you see a fellow brother in sin, you have an obligation, according to verse 3, to rebuke them. Boy, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? You know, we don't really like to do that. I'd rather eat tree bark than go confront somebody, but that's really the biblical mandate. And if they repent, forgive them. It's a cause and effect relationship. Now look at verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. You go, wow, this is, okay. I, do you, anybody have a problem with verse 4? I mean, I do. I, I've wrestled with verse 4 a lot over the years. Because what's, what's the point that you become a doormat? All right? Isn't there a place in there where... You know, if somebody comes back to you seven times a day with the exact same thing, and you know, how many times do you forgive them until you, you become kind of used by the process? That's not what this is talking about. And I'll unwrap that in a minute because it was a number of years ago I had something go on in my life, and it, it, opened, up the, it opened up the door to me to understand verse 4 a little bit better. Now let's take a look at, at the idea of how forgiveness and seeking forgiveness and saying those words differs from just simply apologizing. Because here, in, at least in my country, uh, people apologize, but they don't seek forgiveness. And sometimes they only apologize when they're drug kicking and scratching with the offense, right? It's, it's not easy to say, I'm sorry. It's like saying, I'm wrong. We don't want to do it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something. Let's take this, this pen that I've got here. And let's say this is the offense. 
Now, I'm not saying that apologizing is wrong. What I am saying is apologizing is incomplete by itself. It needs to be followed by the words, will you please forgive me? And then that needs to be followed up by a, a good restoration with that other person. So let's unwrap all the pieces of this, right? We've offended somebody. Now, we always, I always judge myself based on my own intentions. And I judge you on your actions. So if you walk by and you step on my foot and it causes me pain, I get upset and I might yell or say something and, and you say, well, I didn't intend to step on your foot, well, but you caused me pain, right? So what should you do? You should say, well, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to do that, all right? And then I should forgive you for that. Well, saying you're sorry only states a fact and it only tells somebody how you feel about something. It's clear and obvious to everybody. I feel bad, you feel bad, we've stated that fact. Have we done anything yet? Do you ever wonder why, especially in a marriage or with your children, uh, something that you thought you got cleared up six months ago and you revisit that same territory and you kind of touch that nerve and it's just as raw as it was six months ago and you go, wait, I, I thought we put this behind us. I told you I was sorry. Well, Dad, Mom, yeah, saying you're sorry was only telling me how you felt about it and stating a fact, but it, it didn't put any medication on the wound. And so if you've got a wound, you've got to put some medicine on it. What's the biblical medicine? It's the words, will you please forgive me? Oh my word, that doesn't trip off the tongue easily, does it? We think to ask for forgiveness, it's got to be something huge, right? Some calamitous event that, oh my word, it's way out of, no. We should be seeking forgiveness in the little things. And Luke 17 is going to take us in that direction in a minute, and I'll show you why. Let's go back to this. Let's say this pen is the offense, whatever it is. And, uh, and I've caused an offense, and I, I come up to you and I, I take this offense and I say, uh, boy, I'm really sorry. I feel terrible about what I just did. That's the equivalent of taking the offense and just kind of sticking it under your arm. You're not giving the other person the opportunity to take the offense and discard it. So relationships, right? Especially with your children. You've offended them in some way. You were harsh. Your words were out of line. You were sarcastic. You were over the top. You lost it. You got angry. You need to go and say, I am sorry for the way I spoke to you earlier. It was inappropriate. But now if you stick it under your arm, they're going to, they're going to, nothing gets done, right? You need to follow it up by saying the words, will you please forgive me? Now watch how this works. Let's say this is the offense and it was between you and I. And I say, you know what, I'm really sorry for the way, I, I backed out of the parking lot earlier and I, I banged into your car and I, I busted your taillight out. And I was going to drive away, but I thought I'd better go get right with you. So I'm really sorry for my careless driving. Will you please forgive me? Now what does she have the opportunity to do that she didn't have a minute ago when I took it and did like this? You now have the opportunity to discard the whole episode, don't you? So now you can say, yes, I, I forgive you. Now are we done? Now our relationship's pretty good at this point. In fact, it might be better than it was in the, in the first place because, yeah, I'm a careless driver and yeah, we got to get the thing fixed, but what do I need to do at this point? Well, I need to give her my insurance card, and we need to, I need to make sure that that car gets restored to her satisfaction, not mine. And I need to make it as easy on you as possible because this was my bad, not your bad. But if I just walk away or I tell you I'm sorry and then leave, wow, what a terrible guy. You know, you go, that, that character guy, he ran into my car and then he drove off. Right? I need to, the, the equivalent of driving off is just saying you're sorry. We need to seek and say the words, will you please forgive me? Mom and dad, you can teach your children to say the words, will you please forgive me? Now, at first, it might be a little hard to get them to say that, but you're going to work them through that. You must say, you must seek forgiveness now. Use must and now in that statement, and then get them to, to come and say the words, will you please forgive me? It'll become second nature for them after you practice it enough times, and you'll see them doing it on their own. There'll be a, some offense that you weren't even part of, and you'll see them going, you know, I, you know what, I blew it. Will you please forgive me? Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing when you see them sorting it out by themselves and you're not even involved. So that's what this is all about. So at the end of it, we need to restore with one another. We need to restore what was taken away. Let's go back to the text in Luke 17. So where does the point where we become a doormat? Well, in verse 4, it says, if he comes back to you seven times a day and returns seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. I used to think that was the same exact offense seven times in a row. And at some point, you've got to say, time out, this isn't working. All right, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the power of seeking and granting forgiveness. When you do it in a sincere and genuine way, the floodgates of repentance will open up in, in your life and in other people's lives. I had a friend who was a, a very close friend and a, a, an assistant pastor with me, and he, uh, he had been involved in a life of sin, a double life that nobody knew about for years. 
but he was crushed by his weight. His immorality crushed him after a while. And, and before he got caught, he came out with it and he said to me and his wife and his family in the church, he said, I've been sinning. I, I got caught up in this thing. And, and he, once he finally confessed that big sin, it was like the whole dam broke loose and the water just came out from behind it. He was so sensitive about every little sin issue in his life, he got annoying. All right. He would come in and he's, if, he, if he moved a paperclip on your desk, he'd say, will you please forgive me for moving your paperclip? I didn't ask permission to do that. I'm like, I kept telling him, you don't have to ask me forgiveness. And, and it took me back to this verse and I thought, he just, he's feeling good by being clean for the first time in a long time and he wants to stay clean. So you know what? If your kids are quick to, to seek forgiveness and, and repent, don't begrudge them to do that. Don't hold them back from that. Let those floodgates open up. It's very good for us as well. If you got some sin you need to confess, or maybe it's the person sitting next to you. When you get in the car and you go home tonight, confess that sin to them. And then tell the other person, yeah, I forgive you. All right, and don't hold back from that. So now in verse 5, the apostle said to the Lord, look at you can write the word sarcastic next to this. They said this, increase our faith. And the Lord looks at them because their response to this was, in the modern vernacular, it would be this. Oh, yeah, right, like that's going to happen anytime soon. That was, that was the apostle's response to Jesus. Jesus doesn't take this lightly. I can picture his eyes getting real thin, and he looks at them and he says this in verse 6. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to the mulberry tree, Be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. He gives you the most absurd contrast. The mustard seed is so small you can hardly see it. That's how much faith you need to ask a tree to uproot itself and jump into the sea. I mean, can you picture that? That's so ridiculous. You don't need a lot of faith to do what I just asked you to do. This is not a faith issue, Jesus is telling us. This is what? An obedience issue. Seeking forgiveness is not something we get drug kicking and scratching to. It's not the most we can do. It's the least we can do. It's entry-level Christianity. It's not a big, magnificent thing on our part. It's something that should be a common occurrence in our lives. He goes on to give us an example. He says in verse 7, Which of you having a, a slave plowing and tending sheep will say to him when he comes in from the field, Come immediately, sit down and eat. But will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you may eat and drink? There's an appropriate you know, thing that goes on here, right? He says not, uh, he, he does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. This isn't a matter of great faith. This is a matter of faithful obedience to the Lord. If you call yourself a child of God and you're a Christian, the least you can do is be seeking forgiveness on a regular basis from your spouse, from others around you, and from your children. Why? Because we blow it all the time. We just do. When was the last time you said the words, will you please forgive me? And if you can't remember the last time you said those words, you got to get the shovel of forgiveness out and start digging. Because there's a whole list of things that we need to go and seek forgiveness for. Don't do it all at once. Get them out. Do them one at a time. And on the next page, there's kind of a way to do it. So let me show you this. You want to surrender. I call this an unconditional surrender. I'm sorry for offending you. That's an apology. Will you please forgive me for, and state what the offense is, and then put a period right there. Don't go any further. Anything you say after that may erase what you just said in front of that. So just state the offense. Honey, I am so sorry for the way I spoke to you right now. Will you please forgive me for my harsh tone just now? Period. If I say, but, sometimes you make me so mad, I just erased everything I just said. I don't really mean it. So stop. This is an unconditional surrender. You're, and, and then it's up to her. You know, but I've done my right part in this by, by stating the offense and then leaving it at that. I think we need to do that. Let me give you one final illustration of how powerful forgiveness is. And this is an illustration from my own life. But uh, we lived up in Bath, Maine, and it's a beautiful little town with quaint little uh, wooden houses up in, in Maine. And, and, uh, but in those wooden Maine houses, in those uh, harsh environment up there, you have to paint those houses every three or four years to keep them in shape. And so um, 
it was about time to paint my house and I was deliberating how I was gonna do that. Meanwhile, I'm living right next door to another guy, he's got a wooden house. And this guy was a grouch. I never met him. I would waved to him every once in a while, he never waved back. I didn't even know his name. And our, my property line was right up against his. And there was this bush that the, the roots were on my side of the property line, but the bush had grown over on his side of the property. And it got so big, and it was at the end of the driveway, I couldn't see the traffic coming. So I said, I gotta trim down that bush. So eventually I got my chainsaw out, and, and I went over and I knocked on his door one day. And uh, he, uh, he came to the door, and uh, I stuck out my hand. And I said, hey, I'm your next door neighbor. My name's Steve. And he didn't take my hand. Now, there's only two things that infuriate me instantly. I think one is if you were to spit on me, and the other is if you don't take my hand for no reason. Oh, that upset me. So I pulled my hand in and I said, look, uh, you know, I started talking about the bush and how I was going to trim it. And he said, look, the bush is on my side of the property. Don't touch it. Slams the door in my face. Oh, was I mad. I said, oh, my God. And you're a man when you got a chainsaw, right? So I walked back. I fired up that chainsaw. He's looking through the window. I took that thing right down to the nub, right? I picked the bush up. I threw it in my yard. I threw the chainsaw in the front yard and I stormed into the house. Our relationship was as bad as it could possibly be. Would you agree with that? Okay. So now uh, the whole year goes by and the next year comes around. Uh, and it's time to paint the house. So I'm looking, I, I talked to some painters, and, and the one guy had a great offer. He said, I can spray paint your house. And he said, we'll get it all done in one day. He came in with the best price, looked like he did good work. And I said, okay, let's do it. He said, now, we gotta make sure we pick a day where it's completely calm, no wind, because you gotta move all the cars because there's overspray, right? And I said, okay, that's fine. Middle of July, nice calm day. He said, I'm coming over today to paint your house. So I moved all the cars, got all the way up. He did a great job, took about uh, eight hours to do the whole house, we were all done. The next day, Mr. Wonderful from next door comes over up on my front porch, knocks on the door. Bam, 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 bam. Like, what is this all about? I open up the door. He says, you painted my car. What? He said, you painted my car. You're like, all right, let me see. So I walk out. This guy's got this 1972 Buick something or another, all right? It's, it's spent a lot of winters out in Maine. It had one of those old Landau roofs and all the stuffing is coming out of it. It's got, it's just all rusted all over. This car isn't worth 300 bucks, right? And uh, so I, at any rate, I look at it and sure enough, some flakes of paint have gone over the top of his house and landed on this car. Oh. So I, I can push them and they just roll off, but you know, I, I, what, what do I do? I'm in that moment, right? And the Lord's going like this, Steve, ask him to forgive you. Steve, ask him to forgive you. I'm like, Lord, I'm not asking this guy to forgive me. I don't care a bit about him. I'm not saying it. Steve, you better say the words. No, Lord. And I'm having this internal conflict. He's looking at me like, what's going on? So I said, well, have you tried to get it washed? And he said, no. I said, well, would you mind if I paid to go get it washed? And he looked at me kind of funny. And the Lord's all over me. And I said, well, I'm really sorry for this. The Lord's going, Steve, Steve, you teach that lesson. It's not complete yet. You told him how you feel about it. You stated a fact. Buddy, you got one more step to go. And I'm like, no. Oh. So I'm having this internal conflict. And finally, I said the words. I said, okay, if I take it over and have it washed and that doesn't do it, big deep breath, I said, first of all, I need to say this to you. Will you please forgive me for my carelessness? He looked at me like I had three heads and I was from Mars. His mouth just dropped open like this. And I said, and now I'm going to restore with him. I said, and if the car wash doesn't do it, I'm willing to pay to have your car painted, restored to the condition that you would like it in, if that's okay with you. He looked at me and he goes, he stuck his hand out. He's shaking my hand like this, right? He goes, hey, by the way, my name's Wayne. He goes, I'm your neighbor. He said, I'm just uh, wanting to point out to you, don't be careless when you spray paint in your house. You know, you got to pick a perfectly calm day. He said, don't worry about that car. It's not worth 300 bucks. I'm thinking it's not worth 200 bucks, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, and he said, but you know, I just want, he said, you got a mess of kids over there. I said, well, yeah, I do. And he, he knew all the kids. So the kids had been talking to this guy through the fence. He'd been giving them candy and stuff, and they had a relationship going on. And so all of a sudden, he's shaking my hand. Now, look, he never said the words, yes, I forgive you. But by his demeanor and his response, he said the words, will you please forgive me, right? His actions proved it. He, 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 Wayne had a wife. Who knew? I never saw this woman. I don't know if he kept her locked up in the basement or what. I never saw her coming in and out of the house. She was a delightful lady. He had us over for dinner the next week. The relationship was better than it had ever been before. By the way, I didn't have to, to paint his car. Um, you know, the car washed it. And, and so, but the power of seeking and saying the words, will you please forgive me, took a relationship that was so miserable, the chainsaw low, to the point where I just simply said the words, and this guy became a pretty good friend after a while. That's how powerful forgiveness is. And it doesn't make any difference how you feel about it. You don't have to like it. You just have to what? Do it. Do it. All right? It's going to absolutely transform the relationships 
in your world. Now I want to bring Megan out. Megan, I want you to, to add your, your wonderful perspective here to this lesson about forgiveness. Thanks, honey. All right. That was a pretty serious lesson, huh? And uh, every time I hear it, every time Steve preaches it, it's convicting to my heart because I'm slow to seek forgiveness. I'll say I'm sorry, but he's right. It's hard to seek forgiveness, and, uh, and we need to. As parents, it's essential that you seek forgiveness for your children. If you don't seek forgiveness, it's that mountain of sin begins to heap up and the mountain of misunderstanding and miscommunication and mistrust. And all of a sudden you're like, well, this precious child that, you know, I held her and I read stories to her and I loved her. And all of a sudden we aren't communicating at all. And sometimes it's their fault, but you know what? Sometimes it's ours. And sometimes we need to seek forgiveness if we've been harsh, if we've been unjust, if we've overreacted. We need to be quick to seek their forgiveness. Yeah, we're modeling for them how to do it. But more importantly, we're doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord, right? We need to be quick to seek forgiveness. There's a danger that we face as parents, and it's the danger of overreaction. I mentioned this before. You know, we act like we're surprised when our children sin. And um, I, I'm not surprised anymore when they sin because I sin. I sin all the time, and so do they, they. But when we overreact, you know, when we fly off the cuff, when we say hurtful words, when we when we assign a motive to their behavior, when we assign a character to them, you're always the worst child in this house. You're always disobedient. You're nothing but a disappointment to us. What we're doing is we're ruining relationship and we have to seek forgiveness from our children for that. When we don't and when we overreact like that, our children will no longer feel safe to come to us. Why would they come seek forgiveness from someone who's going to overreact with them? Right. One of the things that I learned, and I, you know, it took me a long time to learn this lesson because I used to be surprised by my kids' sin. You know, like, how in the world? They were raised in this Christian home, and they ought to know better, and why would they do something like this? And I would be so shocked by it every time um, that I would overreact. And God really convicted my heart of this. Um, after one major thing we had just a few years ago, um, one of my children, they blew it. They just really blew it. And they had to seek forgiveness from other people and they had to seek forgiveness from their father and they had to seek forgiveness from me. And then I watched what Steve was talking about, that freedom they had and how full of joy they were because they were forgiven, right? And I was walking around like the world was ending. And um, that child said to me, Mom, it, it breaks my heart because you just seem so sad. And so I went and talked to the Lord about it because I forgave him, but I was having trouble moving on. And this is what the Lord laid on my heart. Our kids are going to sin. We need our kids to be good repenters. You know, I pray so much that they're not going to sin. I changed my prayer. Would you please teach my children how to be good repenters? Because if your children know how to get right with the Lord, and if they know how to seek forgiveness from you and from anyone else they've wronged, they're going to be successful in their walk with the Lord and in their relationships in this life. So we got to pray for our kids that they would learn how to repent. And we have to stop overreacting. Right? We have to stop acting like their sin is a surprise. It's not a surprise to God any more than our sin is a surprise to God. We just need to deal with it, you know, apply consequences as necessary, teach them how to seek forgiveness, teach them how to repent, seek forgiveness, and restore with others. Another um, thought that we had as we were talking about children seeking forgiveness, there comes a point you can't, in the same way you can't force a child to potty train, you can't force a child to seek forgiveness. We can teach them how. We can teach them the words. You know, I say to my kids, I want you to insert the character quality that you blew and the proper character quality that ought to be there. We can teach them all that. But it's between them and the Lord if they're going to repent in their heart. And at some point, we have to allow our children and ourselves to surrender with dignity. We get in these battles that are so circular and we're just going around and around and around for hours. Sometimes you even forget how you got into the battle, right? What was the thing you did in the first place that made me so mad? Because now I'm just mad that you won't seek forgiveness, right? We need to allow them to surrender with dignity. And sometimes as the older and wiser, we need to be the ones to say, you know what? I'm not happy with how this is ending, but we're going to table this for now. I want you to go think about it 
and I'm going to go think about it. And then you go be faithful to pray for your children. If it's an area where they need to repent and it's clear they need to repent, it's fine to talk to the Lord and say, would you please do whatever it takes to bring this child to repentance? One of the hardest prayers I've had for my kids is, Lord, take them to the end of their rope. And if that looks horrible, and if it means things happen to them that I would never want to have happen to them, take them to the end of the rope if it'll bring them to repentance with you. That's a hard prayer to pray as a, as a parent. It's even harder to watch it happen. But once they reach that point of repentance, then they're free. And to see your kids free of sin, to see them forgiven is the most beautiful thing. So um, I'm going to try and get through this one without getting tearful. But our, our daughter Molly, and she knows that I'd share this story. Um, our firstborn grandchild, well, our first grandchild was stillborn. So she wasn't firstborn, but she was stillborn on her due date. And that was a hard thing for our family, but for Molly especially, she made it, she purposed in her heart that if that's how God dealt with things, she didn't want anything to do with God. And we had a rough couple years where Molly just determined, I want nothing to do with God, and I don't really care if he has anything to do with me. And, um, and her dad and I loved her, and we prayed for her, and we continually said, you know what we think about the things that you're doing. And, um, but Molly wanted nothing to do with the Lord. After about two years, um, God got her heart. She uh, decided to join the Air Force, and she was at basic training, and the only safe place for her was the chapel. She got to go to the chapel on Sunday morning, and she got to go on Wednesday night, and they couldn't make her do push-ups, and they couldn't, nobody yelled at her. And so she went to church, and God began to draw her heart back to him, and she repented. And we talked about it, and she asked our forgiveness, and we thought it was done. So Molly, um, Molly got married after boot camp. She married another Air Force uh, uh, airman. And um, last year, she delivered identical twins. They were uh, grandbabies number four and five. And we were there right after Molly delivered. She delivered at 31 weeks, and it was a C-section. And it was, you know, you know how it is after labor, right? Everything's excited. The babies were whisked away. Her dad and I were alone in the room with her. Her husband was with his parents. She called us over, and, you know, we're, oh, Molly, the babies are so precious. And she stopped us, and she said, I just have to ask you one more time. Will you forgive me? Sorry. She said, I need you to know that I am not the girl I was, and to believe that you forgive what I did. And we did, and that did it. And we watched Molly, as a young mom, experience the freedom from the sin that she still carried because she hadn't felt forgiven from us. Forgive your kids. Forgive your kids. If you withhold forgiveness or you withhold restoration, you are, you are being cruel. We have to be the adults in this. We have to forgive them. We have to forgive our spouses, right? We need to be able to teach our children how to seek forgiveness. We need to, ex to model it for them. We need to extend it to them graciously and lavishly, just like the Lord Jesus Christ extends his forgiveness to us. <sighs> so my prayer for you guys this week is that you ask the Lord, do I have a heart of forgiveness? Am I prepared to forgive those who have wronged me? Am I prepared to forgive my children when they hurt me and when they disappoint me, remembering that the, they hurt you, Lord, and they disappoint you? This is such a serious lesson. You know, we've taught lots of fun things and lots of tools. If you walk away with only one thing from the nine practices of the proactive parent, let it be this. Let it be this, that you know how to seek forgiveness and you know how to extend forgiveness. I'm just going to close this session in a word of prayer, and, uh, and then we'll be back for the next session. Father God, thank you that you are lavish in your forgiveness toward us, and that, Lord, while we were yet sinners, you sent your Son to die for us, and he did that out of faithful obedience to you. Lord, help us out of faithful obedience to be parents and spouses who are quick to forgive, who are quick to seek forgiveness, who call sin, sin, and are willing to repent and restore. Lord, let us never be punitive or hold back forgiveness, but let us just be gracious. Lord, some of us may have relationships that even tonight we need to just go and get right. Lord, let's run to it. You know, let's not walk Let's not stumble. Let's not drag our feet. But Lord, help us to run to that place where we seek forgiveness for others. We seek forgiveness for our sin. And Lord, we're clean before you. 
Father, I pray for our children. Help them to learn to be great repenters. And I pray all these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, sweetie. That was beautiful. Well, folks, that was a special session. I think we've got a lot to think about, a lot to talk about in the car on the way home. And so I'm going to close this out and just say thanks for being with us this week, and we're looking forward to seeing you next time.